the church is a family. The church is a family. The Bible calls the church a family in the book of Ephesians in chapter 3. And we're to love. And that's that mystery form of the kingdom. That mystery church is what we're talking about. Uh, the, the, the church is to love. The church is to care for each other. The church is to have compassion. We heard some bad news today. I got a phone call. Miss Joe Bear's not coming to the door. And so Brother Chris was knocking on the door. Miss Edmonds was there earlier knocking on the door. Brother Gene was knocking on the door. We had members of the body that cared for the body. They were there trying to get her to the door. They heard the dog barking, finally called the police. And, and of course, you know the rest of the news. Well, uh, and it is, a, it is a time to be sad in a sense. But though, for those that know the Lord Jesus Christ, it's a time to rejoice. It's a time to rejoice, amen, that we're going to be with the Lord one day. The church is a family. So this local assembly that we have right here, the Faith Baptist Church, the local assembly, as Corinth was a local assembly, as the church in Thessalonica was a, was a local assembly, as the one in Colossae was a local assembly, and we go on, Brother Archer's teaching, on some local assemblies in the book of Revelation chapter number 2 and chapter 3. We have the church at Sardis and Smyrna and Philadelphia, Laodicea, Ephesus, and so on and on and on. We have local assemblies. Amen. Somebody says, well, I'm the part of the invisible church. I've never seen an invisible church. You need to be a part of the local body. Amen. The local body. We are a manifestation of God's body. So we're not, we're not, only, not only a body, the body of Christ, we're a family. Now, the Bible calls us a family. And uh, members of the family, we ought to love one another. Now, not only that, we're an army. We're an army. Ephesians chapter number 6 tells the body, the family, to put on some armor. Because we're battling against the wiles of the devil. And the Bible said, put on the armor that ye may be able to stand in times of trouble, in times of need. Then he gives us a list of the armor. So we are an army. Amen. We're at war. We're battling spiritual uh, beings and wickedness in high places is what the Bible says. Now, not only that, the Bible calls us in 1 Corinthians chapter number 3 and verse number 16, he calls us a temple. Now, if you want to go to the individual temple, you can go to 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19 and 20. But if you want to look at the body, the body being a temple, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, speaking about the uh, judgment seat of Christ and not to defile the temple, the body of Christ. The Bible gives us some severe warnings talking about bad mouth in the body or the temple. Amen. You better be good to the church. The church is good to you. Yeah, well, that church over there, they talk about this. Let me tell you something. There's, there's people that talk about people, and that shouldn't be that way. It shouldn't be that way, I grant you. And we can say hypocrites or dissimilators, if you'd like to use another word. Uh, but you can go to the bank, and there's a lot of hypocrites there, but you'll still go. Amen. There's some hypocrites down there at the grocery store, but you'll still go. There's some hypocrites where you work, but you'll still go. And you'll get your paycheck on Friday and smile about it. I put, oh, you don't get your paycheck and say, oh, I had to put up with all them hypocrites all week long. No, but if there's a hypocrite, you'll pick him out in the church and you won't go back. That's a sad, you know what it is? That's a lame brain excuse. You know the Greek word for that? Baloney. <laughs> Amen. It is. Amen. So uh, the, the church is a family. The church is an army. The church is a temple. Did you know the Bible talks about the church being the bride? The bride. We are God's bride. We are, and Ephesians 5 is such a beautiful chapter to read. We're to love the, our wives as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. God compares you as his bride. And there's nothing more beautiful than the bride. I wonder why when I got married, everyone wouldn't say, oh, the groom is so good looking. <laughs> we didn't want him to lie. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, everyone's eyes was on my bride. Amen. It was on the bride. And uh, everyone's eyes are on the bride today. They cannot see the Lord Jesus Christ, but they can see you. They can see you. Their eyes is on the bride. Now, how are you portraying your husband? Amen. Uh, the Bible talks about the virtuous woman in Proverbs 31 portrayed her husband in such a manner that everyone knew him in the gates. Amen. So we ought to portray our husband 
that everyone would know how wonderful he is and how good and how kind he is. All right, so uh, each, um, now each member of the body has a very, very, very important role in the body, in the body of Christ. And each image that the church is under, such as being the body, a family, an army, a temple, and a bride, each image has an important lesson also to teach us. Now, there's three passages that Paul gives emphasis to the church as a body. Three passages that Paul gives emphasis to the church as a body. And in each of these passages, he brought out the same three important truths. In each passage, Paul brought out these same three important truths. And the truths that he brought out were unity, diversity, and maturity. Unity, diversity, and maturity. Now, if you have a sheet of paper and you want to draw a line, you can put unity, diversity and maturity and then draw you a line straight down by each word there and you can put 1 Corinthians chapter number 12 and verse 1 through 13 being unity. Unity. 1 Corinthians chapter 12 verse 1 through 13. Unity is important. Right under 1 Corinthians chapter 12 verse 1 through th uh, 13 you can put down Romans chapter number 12 and verse 1 through 5. He speaks of unity. Unity in the body. Unity in the body, where we're at in our text right here in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and also Romans chapter 12, verse 1 through 5. You can also write down under that Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 1 through 6. Now, I, I did this. I used to do, back in, this dates me. This dates me. And Brother Donnell's dated too because he does it too. An overhead. You know what that is? All right. <laughs> All right, I, I, on the overhead, I don't know, you can't see that from there, but I've drew a line. I put unity, diversity, and maturity. Under unity, I listed what I just listed right there. Under diversity, now diversity, we're different. We, we're different, yet we're in unity. My, my, my little finger is different from my thumb. My nose is different from my ear. My eye is different from my toe. And on and on and on. I mean, it don't take a rocket scientist to figure it out. But we're all, we all function together in unity. We're diverse, yet we function together in unity. All right, now under diversity, you can write 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 14 through 31. And then you can write down Romans chapter 12, verse 6 through 8. And you can write down Ephesians chapter 4, verse 7 through 12. Remember what we said, three passages, Paul gives emphasis to the church as a body, and in each of these passages, Paul brings out um, the same, the very same important truths. That's unity, diversity, and then maturity. Maturity, you can write down 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 1 through 13. And then you can write down Romans chapter 12, verse 9 through 21. And also, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 13 through 16. Now, some of you are really getting into the message I can tell because you're looking down and you're writing. Others know it. You already know it all, so you don't need to write it down. Amen. Yes, ma'am. Diversity. First one. 1 Corinthians 12, 14 through 31. Romans chapter 12, verse 6, 7, and 8. 6 through 8. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 7 through 12. All right, you have unity, diversity, and maturity. Now, I hopefully, if you won't forget this. Yes, ma'am. Maturity. 1 Corinthians 12, uh, 13, 1 through 13. The whole chapter of 1 Corinthians 13. Uh, Romans chapter 12, verse 9 through 21. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 13 through 16. The, the three passages, 1 Corinthians, Romans, and Ephesians, each deal with unity, diversity, and maturity. And also, uh, also it's impossible to discuss the body without also, without also discussing the ministry of the Holy Ghost or the ministry of the Holy Spirit. It was the Spirit of God that gave birth, listen to me now, it was the Spirit of God 
who gave birth to the body that we're talking about at Pentecost, who ministers in and through the body. Now, there's some... Uh, there's a lot of views out there and a lot of beliefs. Now, what you're going to have to do is get in the Bible and find out which one or what the Bible has to say. And I'm asking you to do that because you know what? If, if I was a member of another denomination, I'll say this is what the Bible says. And I could pick out a verse and just about make it say anything I wanted to. If I said baptism is part of salvation, the first thing I would use is Acts 2.38. And then I'd just ramble on and on and on and on about repent and be baptized for the remission of sins. I would be plucking a verse out of context and trying to teach you something that's not true. Well, what I'm asking you to do is get in your Bible, look what's before it, look what's after it. There's a lot of, there's a lot of discussion about the birthday of the church. Whatever birthday you want to give the church, that's between you and the Lord. You get in the Bible and find out. As your pastor and preacher, the birthday of the church is in Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2. Now, then you have others that call themselves dispensationalists. You and I, and I'm not teaching on dispensations tonight. I'm not even going to try to. You and I believe in dispensationalism. God uh, working out His will in a particular economy. And we believe there's seven of them. Now, there are some hyper-dispensationalists that will believe there's like 36 or 40. Hyper-dispensationalists. There's some that believe there's three. There's some that believe there's nine. We believe there's seven dispensations. Now, that's not the lesson today, but I'm telling you this for a reason. I'm telling you this for a reason. You got your hyper-dispensationalist that tells you that Acts chapter number 2 is back on Old Testament ground. You'll have some, you'll have your hyper-dispensationalist that will tell you that uh, born again in John chapter 3 is not for the church today. You got your hyper-dispensationalist that will tell you under Israel's economy it was a work salvation. And they're real dogmatic about it. They don't pull any strings about it. They're above board. They'll tell you what they believe. And uh, I'm telling you that the church was born in Acts chapter 2. And I'm going to give you some scripture today that you can look at and uh, we'll go from there. Now, Acts chapter number 2, we realize that Peter was preaching and he was preaching at uh, Pentecost and he was preaching mainly and primarily to the Jews. Now, you and I both know that at Pentecost that everyone came up. All the Jews came up at Pentecost. And that's where God chose after telling the disciples to wait in the upper room. And uh, he would reveal to them what they needed to know. And, of course, Acts chapter number 1 tells us that. And the Holy Ghost showed up in the, in the upper room in Acts chapter number 2. And then we have the, the famous, famous Pentecost. Now, Pentecost, there's penna means 50. There's 50. Every 50 years, there's a Pentecost. But here is the famous Pentecost that's recorded in Acts chapter number 2. Now, not only were Jews present, but we had Gentiles present as well. You say, where, where can we find that to be true? Well, I mean, honest to goodness, you, use your mind and read the scripture. Who We had the Ethiopian eunuch coming up for the festivals. Uh, and uh, there is where he was reading in Isaiah and then Philip left and joined up the chariot and explained to him. So there was people of all nations and kindreds there. And that's all of them. So God showed us that he broke the language barrier with the tongues as we read in Acts chapter number 2. All right, now I'm in Acts chapter number 2. Acts chapter number 2. Um, Peter preached one of the best sermons that you've ever heard right there. He said in verse 22, uh, Ye men of Israel, hear these words, Jesus of Nazareth, the man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs which God did by him in the midst of you as yourselves also know. And him being delivered by the determinate for foreknowledge and counsel and uh, uh, counsel and foreknowledge of God ye have taken by wicked hands and have crucified him, whom God has raised up, having loosed the pains of death because it was not possible that he should be holden of it. So we have the death, burial, and the resurrection of the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, also, um, you got to remember that uh, back in Matthew chapter number 16, verse number 18, this, listen to me now, it's going to fall right in. Upon this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. 
All right, God said he will build it. He didn't say it was built. He said he will build it. Some people think that he was building it then. Some people think that he built it when he breathed on them. He started the church when he breathed on them the Holy Spirit. If you believe that, then he breathed on Judas. He breathed the Holy Spirit on Saul back in the Old Testament. So I don't think you can really count that one. I don't think you can do it. Here at this particular time in Acts chapter 2, the Holy Spirit did something that he has never done before that he will never do again. He came collectively and individually. The church was in the well. Jesus said, wait. Jesus told them that they would see the glory of God. The Spirit of God coming is the glory of God. Amen. So we're seeing some great things happen here. Now again, if you choose not to believe it's Acts chapter number 2, that's, that's fine and all right. It's not going to cause you to lose your salvation. Amen. All right. But now we go on right here in Acts chapter number 2. Now I want you to notice something. Now, in, in Acts chapter number 2, Peter was given the keys of the kingdom, meaning authority. So he unlocked the gospel to the Jews, and that's recorded in Acts chapter 2. He also unlocked the gospel in Acts chapter 10 to the Gentiles, being Cornelius. And we say unlock the gospel. God had given him and identified the gospel with him and gave him that authority to exercise the use of the keys. And that's exactly what he did. All right, now in Acts chapter 2, he preached this great, wonderful sermon. And in Acts chapter 2, verse 47, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church what? They added to who? The church. This church is the same as 1 Corinthians. In the book of Acts 18, 19, and 20, Paul spent time in Corinth and Ephesus and there started the church. There, the, They actually started those local assemblies. And so we're still talking about the church. You say, well, why does he call it the mystery in, Acts, in uh, Ephesians? Because Paul is revealing to you what had happened. The mystery, the mystery is Jesus Christ in you, the hope of glory. The mystery is that Jew and Gentile, because that middle wall of partition has been broken down, are added into the body. The body started there in Acts chapter 2. And from that point on, there was souls added to the body or the bride of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, be careful who you read after. That's what I'm going to tell you. Read your Bible. You be careful who you read after. You've got people that'll put Acts chapter 2 and verse 38 uh, specifically for Israel and they'll call it a work salvation. That wasn't no more a work salvation or the water saving you or washing your sins away than the man in the moon. It was simply for identification then. It's for identification now. Amen. Amen. God does not change. He does not change. Salvation's been by grace through faith from the beginning. It's still by grace through faith in Acts chapter 2. And it will be by grace through faith in the tribulation and in the millennium until he establishes a brand new heaven and earth. Amen. I guarantee it. That's what the Bible says. And if you try to refute that, you're going to read in errors in the Bible and you're going to be so confused yourself you don't know what ends up. I'm telling you. God does it one way. He don't change. He don't do it this way one way and then turn right around and say another one's got to jump through some hoops and another one's got to be baptized in the Jordan and another one's got to be baptized. Another one's got to be speaking in tongues and on and on and on and on. What kind of God do you think you serve? I am God. I change not. Amen. All right. Now we're in Acts chapter. Look at Acts chapter 5 verse 11. And great fear came upon all the church and as many as heard these things. Church, look at Acts chapter 8, verse 1. This thing hadn't changed. This church that was born in Acts 2 carries on. The Bible said in Acts chapter number 8, verse number 1, And Saul was consenting unto his death, and at that time there was a great persecution against the church that was at Jerusalem. The church, what church at Jerusalem? A local manifestation of the body. Thank you, Frank. Uh, the local manifestation of the body. The church. The church. The church at Milton, Florida. Faith Baptist Church. A local manifestation of the body. And God's still adding to the church. He added to this church five in the last two weeks. Added to this local assembly five people. And maybe, maybe more. I don't know. But five made it public. And then if you'll notice right here, the Bible says... Um, Acts chapter number 8, verse 1. Look at 8, verse 3. 
as Saul, as for Saul, he made havoc of the church. A church is a Greek word, ecclesia, meaning called out assembly. I understand there was a church in the wilderness. The, the Israel in the land was never called a church. Israel in the wilderness was called a called out assembly. A church is what the Bible calls it. Now, we're a called out assembly of born again, baptized believers in the body of Christ, manifesting the love, the goodness, the compassion, the long suffering, and, the, and, the, and the, uh, just the grace of God is what we're manifesting. And we're that church. We are that called out assembly. Where that same called out assembly, Peter uh, actually was instrumental in seeing it start in Acts chapter 2. And if you'll notice there in Acts chapter 11, Acts chapter 11, verse number 22, Acts chapter 11, verse number 22, then tidings of these things came into the ears of the church, which was at Jerusalem. And they sent forth Barnabas that he should go as far as Antioch. Did you know the church is the bride of Christ? Did you know the church is commissioned with sending out missionaries? The church is commissioned with, uh, with the, uh, having an under-shepherd and having different offices and gifts within the local assembly to make it run like God wants it to run and to send out missionaries. We're sending out the Vipans. We send out the Kennedys. We're sending out, uh, we have missionaries that directly come out of this local assembly that we send out. Out. And we're part of others that we support around the world as well. And then if you'll notice in um, Acts chapter 12, uh, verse 1. Now about, <clears throat> now about that time, the, uh, Herod the king stretched forth his hands to vex certain of the church. We're still under persecution. Still under persecution. From that day to this day, the church is under persecution. If you'll notice in verse 5 of chapter 12, there, Peter therefore was kept in prison, but prayer was made without ceasing of the church unto God for him. What we did tonight is take prayer requests. And for you visitors, it's kind of difficult to hear each individual give their prayer request. So we encourage you to write it down on a piece of paper. And then Brother Joe comes up here and names out the request and we pray. We make our request and prayer unto God. We make it known, known to each other and known to God. So the church prayed. Acts chapter 13, verse number one. Now there were in the church that was at Antioch. Isn't that something? Antioch. Antioch's the one that sent out Paul. That's Antioch of Syria. Antioch of Syria set out, sent out Paul and Barnabas, missionaries, Paul and Silas. They sent them out to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And there's something else, too, that, and this is not part of the sermon, but I've got to include it. Uh, the church, which was at Jerusalem, who the half-brother of Jesus, James, was the pastor of the church at Jerusalem. But if you'll notice in the book of Acts, the emphasis goes away from the church, that local church at Jerusalem, to the local church where? At Antioch. Now Antioch is that missionary activity, everything going on. Why? Because the Apostle Paul's coming along, a missionary to the Gentiles to keep adding to the church that started in Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2, the church. And we're still doing that today. And if you'll note, uh, Acts 14, verse 23. Acts 14, verse 23. I hope I've given you enough verses. And when they had ordained them elders in every church, every church. Now, every church. So that, that uh, uh, does away with the idea of this universal, invisible church, doesn't it? Every, multiple, plural. Now, we know there's one body. But there is visible manifestations. And so missionaries are not only supposed to get people saved, but when people get saved, they, 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 they give the gospel, but they're to help establish local New Testament Bible-believing churches. Churches. That's what it's all about. Show me where somebody got saved. And by the way, when Paul um, uh, in Colossae, the church at Colossae, Paul, never, Paul actually never went to Colossae and started that church. But if you'll notice, he preached in Philippi. And uh, believers from Philippi, since they wanted to be a part of a local assembly, they went to Colossae and started a church. Churches. Churches. That's what it's all about. Churches. So you hear anyone talk about God's bride and God's body and God's, uh, God's, uh, God's church, you better, better be careful. I'd back away from them. Amen. <laughs> 
You, you know that old saying, back away. From those of you that know me, that's what I did when a fellow was cursing God one time. I thought God was going to zap him. But I found out God zapped Christ for, for him 2,000 years ago. Amen. You tell, that, you tell people, don't talk about my bride. Don't talk about God's bride. God's church is precious. God's church is precious. Amen. So we got to talk about the ministry of the Holy Spirit every time we talk about the body. And you got to remember, too, while at Ephesus and Corinth, uh, there um, in Acts chapter number 18, verse number 20, records when Paul was there establishing these churches of these letters that we're reading you tonight. That we're reading you tonight out of the book of first Corinthians and also uh, Romans now in the Corinthian church the members were grieving the Holy Spirit they were grieving him it was bad they shouldn't have done that but they did we shouldn't grieve him we shouldn't quench him but sometimes we do uh, they were grieving him and quenching him and the Holy Spirit and how are they doing it by their carnal ways by their baby carnal ways they, some had been sitting in the church for some time and they were still acting like a baby. Some had been sitting there for a while and they were still carnal. They had no desire. Now, there's only one of two things wrong with that individual if he remains carnal. Number one, he's not saved. Or number two, he just really doesn't care. I mean, he got in, that's all he wants to do. He got in the family and that's it. That's all he wants to do. Now, let, let everybody else, from this point on, I'm going to sit on the sideline and I'm going, to root the, I'm going to root my favorite team on. Amen. Either now, But you know what God wants you to do is when you join the team, as it were, He wants you to get in the game and play. You don't sit on the sideline rooting your favorite team on. No, you get in there with them. You get in there with them. So, so there's a lot of carnality going on in the church at Corinth. Uh, and they were, and, and one thing that they were doing for sure in 1 Corinthians chapter number 12, they were using their spiritual gifts like children use toys. That's what they were doing. They were using their spiritual gifts like children use toys. The Bible says in verse 1 of chapter 12 of 1 Corinthians, Now concerning spiritual gifts of brethren, I would not have you ignorant. You know that you were Gentiles carried away into these dumb idols even as you were led. Wherefore I give you to understand that no man speaking by the Spirit of God calleth Jesus accursed and that no man can say that Jesus is the Lord but by the Holy Ghost. These are valuable gifts. They're valuable tools. They had such an idea that they needed to promote themselves instead of promoting. Now what does gifts do? Gifts, unity, diversity, and maturity. They edify, get, true gifts edify each other. Ro, uh, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 12, I believe it is. They edify, and gifts are given so that the body is edified and Jesus Christ is magnified. Now, what their problem was is they wanted to bring attention to themselves. In the book of Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, chapter 13, and chapter 14, they were using the gifts that God given them, again, like toys and trying to magnify themselves. They were seeking limelight gifts. I'm not content with being a more team leader. I've got to get in front of you so you can see my pretty face every Sunday. And, 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 and what I'm going to do is I'm going to start babbling in some language because that's, by the way, that's a, that's a, and what a gift that is. People's going to say, ooh, mercy me, look at him, look at her. And so they were misusing these God-given gifts that God had given the church. And then that's why Paul had to check a lot of the women in there. I suffer a woman not to speak or usurp authority. They were misusing their gift. And, and you'll find that, by the way, I didn't say that in case you women want to get mad at me. It's in verse 34 of 1 Corinthians 14. See, the, the, what it is, they were, they were acting like children and they didn't put away their childish toys. And because in, the, um, in Bible days, women were not elevated too high at all. They, they, were, they were abused in a sense that way. All right, so finally, when they got to be a Christian, in other words, when I say abuse, they wouldn't beat on and things like that, but, uh, but they, you know, they, they didn't have any rights whatsoever and didn't have any rights at all. And so what happens when they got saved, the Bible said there's neither bond, free, male, nor female. Well, they jumped on that one. They said, uh-huh. 
And so in the church, they, they knew they were equal. And by the way, they still are equal. Amen. They still are equal. And, 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 but just like um, they, they, they actually abused that, that liberty that they had, and uh, just like a lot of men still abuse the liberty that they have in assemblies and everything else. So we won't go there right now. I don't want to get in too much trouble. But um, nevertheless, they used their... <laughs> They use their gifts like toys, amen. Now, uh, unity, and, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to close right here, but I do want you to do your homework. The gift of the Spirit, we're going to look at that unity in verse number 1 through 13 when we come back next Wednesday. And uh, since there was a division about this unity, Paul points out four bonds of spiritual unity that are always present. Four bonds of spiritual unity and you'll find these in the first 13 verses of 1 Corinthians chapter 12. All right. But let me, let me show you something else before I close. I can't, I, can't, I can't leave this. Go to Romans 12. We're going we to get there in a couple of weeks but I, I'm, not, I'm not going to pass up just one or two verses right here. Romans 12. Romans chapter 12, I you know these verses. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God. You know those. You had to memorize them in Bible school, didn't you? If you went to Bible school. Um, you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be you transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Look at verse 3. For I say through the grace given unto me to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. Three times in verse 3, you read the word or you'll see the word think. Now, the Bible says that we're to be transformed by the renewing of your mind. There is no way that you can have a gift of the Holy Spirit unless you have a renewed mind. A renewed mind. And if you'll notice, we use those two verses and we even go to verse 3. But then we stop and if you'll go to verse 4, 5, and 6, what's he talking about? Say spiritual gifts. In order to exercise these spiritual gifts and to realize your spiritual gifts, you're going to have to have a renewed mind. You're going to have to have a renewed mind. And so you need to trust Christ as your personal Savior. Now, more than anything else in the world tonight, you, we can talk about gifts and we can talk about the levels of gifts or the gifts given to individuals. But unless you have this, the gift of salvation, the gift of the Holy Spirit in you, which according to 1 Corinthians 12, the moment you believed Him, you were baptized into the body spiritually. Not with water, but spiritually baptized. We'll look at that next week too. But you need to be born again. You need to be saved. So John chapter 3 is not Old Testament ground, being born again. I'll tell you why. Because Peter uses the same expression. Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the will of God, which liveth and abideth forever. You need to be saved. You need to be saved. If you're not saved and you die, you're going to die and you're going to go to hell. And there's not a thing that we or you can do about it. You'll be there. You'll be there for eternity till you go to your cast in the lake of fire. So that's why that we constantly tell you, you must be born again. You need to be saved. You need to have your mind renewed. You need to be saved. You need to be saved. I want to be saved. You need to be saved. More than wanting to, friend, you need to. You need to know if you died, you'd go to heaven. Mr. Joe Bear just went home to be with the Lord. Ms. Joe Bear had a testimony. She did. She had a testimony of knowing the Lord Jesus as her personal Savior. So that's the most important thing you're going to deal with. Let's stand to our feet, please, and we'll be dismissed. Thank you for coming tonight.